Chapter One of The Red Dust by Murray Linster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. The Red Dust by Murray Linster. Chapter One Pray. The sky grew gray and then almost white. The overhanging banks of clouds seemed to withdraw a little from the steaming earth. Haze that hung always among the mushroom forests and above the fungus hills grew more tenuous, and the slow, misty rain that dripped the whole night long ceased reluctantly. As far as the eye could see, a mad world stretched out a world of insensate cruelties and strange, fierce maternal solicitudes. The insects of the night, the great moths, whose wings spread far and wide in the dimness, and the huge fireflies, four feet in length, whose beacons made the earth glow in their pale, weird light, the insects of the night had sought their hiding-places. Now the creatures of the day ventured forth. A great ant-hill towered a hundred feet in the air. Upon its gravel and boulder-strewn side a commotion became visible. The earth crumbled and fell into an invisible opening. Then a dark chasm appeared, and two slender thread-like antennae peered out. A warrior ant emerged and stood for an instant in the daylight, looking all about for signs of danger to the ant city. He was all of ten inches long, this ant, and his mandibles were fierce and strong. A second and third warrior came from the inside of the ant hill and ran with tiny clickings about the hillock, waving their antennae restlessly, searching, ever searching, for a menace to their city. They returned to the gateway from which they had made their appearance evidently bearing reassuring messages, because, shortly after they had re-entered the gateway of the ant city, a flood of black, ill-smelling workers poured out of the opening and dispersed upon their business. The clicking of their limbs and an occasional whining stridulation made an incessant sound as they scattered over the earth, foraging among the mushrooms and giant cabbages, among the rubbish heaps of the gigantic beehives and wasp colonies, and among the remains of the tragedies of the night for food for their city. The city of the ants had begun its daily toil, toil in which every one shared without supervision or coercion. Deep in the recesses of the pyramid galleries were hollowed out and winding passages, that led down a fathomless distance into the earth below. Somewhere in the maze of tunnels there was a royal apartment in which the queen ant reposed, waited upon by assiduous courtiers, fed by royal stewards, and combed and rubbed by the hands of her subjects and children. But even the huge monarch of the city had her constant and pressing duty of maternity. A dozen times the size of her largest loyal servant, she was no less bound by the unwritten but imperative laws of the city than they. From the time of waking to the time of rest, she was ordained to be the Queen Mother in the strictest and most literal sense of the word, for, at intervals, to be measured only in terms of minutes, she brought forth a single egg, perhaps three inches in length, which was instantly seized by one of her eager attendants, and carried in haste to the municipal nursery. There it was placed in a tiny cell a foot or more in length, until a sack-shaped grub appeared, all soft white body save for a tiny mouth. Then the nurses took it in charge and fed it with curious tender gestures, until it had waxed large and fat and slept the sleep of metamorphosis. When it emerged from its rudimentary cocoon, it took the places of its nurses until its soft skin had hardened into the horny armor of the workers and soldiers, and then it joined the throng of workers that poured out of the city at dawn, 
to forage for food, to bring back its finds, and to share with the warriors and the nurses, the drone males and the young queens and all the other members of its community, their duties in the city itself. This was the life of the social insect, absolute devotion to the cause of its city, utter abnegation of self-interest for the sake of its fellows, and death at their hands when their usefulness was past. They neither knew nor expected more or less. It is a strange instinct that prompts these creatures to devote their lives to their city, taking no smallest thought for their individual good, without even the call of maternity or sex to guide them. Only the queen knows motherhood. The others know nothing but toil, for purposes they do not understand, and to an end which they cannot dream. At intervals all over the world of Burl's time these ant cities rose above the surrounding ground, some small and barely begun, and others ancient colonies which were truly the continuation of cities first built when the ants were insects to be crushed beneath the feet of men. These ancient strongholds towered two, three, or even four hundred feet above the plains, and their inhabitants would have had to be numbered in millions, if not billions. Not all the earth was subject to the ants, however. Bees and wasps and more deadly creatures crawled over and flew over its surface. The bees were four feet and more in length, and slender-waisted wasps darted here and there, preying upon the colossal crickets that sang deep bass music to their mates. And the length of the crickets was the length of a man and more. Spiders with bloated bellies waited, motionless, in their snares, whose threads were the size of small cables, waiting for some luckless giant insect to be entangled in the gummy traps. And butterflies fluttered over the festering plains of this new world, tremendous creatures whose wings could only be measured in terms of yards. An outcropping of rock jutted up abruptly from a fungus-covered plain. Shelf fungi and strangely colored moles stained the stone until the shining quartz was hidden, almost completely from view, but the whole glistened like tinted crystal from the dank wetness of the night. Little wisps of vapor curled away from the slopes as the moisture was taken up by the already moisture-laden air. Seen from a distance, the outcropping of rock looked innocent and still, but a nearer view showed many things. Here a hunting wasp had come upon a gray worm, and was methodically inserting its sting into each of the twelve segments of the faintly writhing creature. Presently the worm would be completely paralyzed, and would be carried to the burrow of the wasp, where an egg would be laid upon it, from which a tiny maggot would presently hatch. Then weeks of agony for the great gray worm conscious but unable to move, while the maggot fed upon its living flesh. There the tiny spider, youngest of the hatchlings, barely four inches across, stealthily stalked some other still tinier mite, the little mini-legged larva of the oil beetle known as the bee louse. The almost infinitely small bee louse was barely two inches long and could easily hide in the thick fur of a great bumblebee. This one small creature would never fulfill its destiny, however. The hatchling spider sprang. It was a combat of midgets which was soon over. When the spider had grown and was feared as a huge black-bellied tarantula, it would slay monster crickets with the same ease and the same implacable ferocity. The outcropping of rock looked still and innocent. There was one point where it overhung, forming a shelf, beneath which the stone fell away in a sheer drop. Many colored fungus growths covered the rock, making it a riot of tints and shades. But hanging from the roof-like projection of the stone there was a strange drab-white object. 
It was in the shape of half a globe, perhaps six feet by six feet at its largest. A number of little semicircular doors were fixed about its sides like inverted arches, each closed by a blank wall. One of them would open, but only one. The house was like the half of a pallid orange fastened to the roof of rock. Thick cables stretched in every direction for yards upon yards, anchoring the habitation firmly, but the most striking of the things about the house, still and quiet and innocent, like all the rest of the rock outcropping, were the ghastly trophies fastened to the outer walls and hanging from long silken chains below. Here was the hind leg of one of the smaller beetles. There was the wing case of a flying creature. Here a snail shell, two feet in diameter, hanging at the end of an inch-thick cable. There a boulder that must have weighed thirty or forty pounds, dangling in similar fashion. But fashioned here and there, haphazard and irregularly, were other, more repulsive remnants. The shrunken head armor of a beetle, the fierce jaws of a cricket, the pitiful shreds of a hundred creatures that had formed forgotten meals for the bloated insect within the home. Comparatively small as was the nest of the clotho spider, it was decorated as no ogre's castle had ever been adorned. Legs sucked dry of their contents, corslets of horny armor forever to be unused by any creature, a wing of this insect, the head of that, and dangling by the longest cord of all, with a silken cable wrapped carefully about it to keep the parts together, was the shrunken, shriveled, dried-up body of a long-dead man. Outside the nest was a place of gruesome relics. Within it was a place of luxury and ease. A cushion of softest down filled all the bulging bottom of the hemisphere. A canopy of similarly luxurious texture interposed itself between the rocky roof and the dark, hideous body of the resting spider. The eyes of the hairy creature glittered like diamonds, even in the darkness, but the loathsome attenuated legs were tucked under the round-bellied body, and the spider was at rest. It had fed. It waited, motionless, without desires or aversions, without emotions or perplexities, in comfortable, placid, machine-like contentment until time should bring the call to feed again. A fresh carcass had been added to the decorations of the nest only the night before. For many days the spider would repose in motionless splendor within the silken castle. When hunger came again, a nocturnal foray, a creature would be pounced upon and slain, brought bodily to the nest and feasted upon, its body festooned upon the exterior, and another half-sleeping, half-waking period of dreamful idleness within the sabaritic charnel house would ensue. Slowly and timidly half a dozen pink-skinned creatures made their way through the mushroom forest that led to the outcropping of rock under which the clotho spider's nest was slung. They were men, degraded remnants of the once dominant race. Burl was their leader, and was distinguished solely by two three-foot stumps of the feathery golden antennae of a night-flying moth he had bound to his forehead. In his hand was a horny, chitinous spear, taken from the body of an unknown flying creature killed by the flames of the burning purple hills. Since Burl's return from his solitary and involuntary journey, he had been greatly revered by his tribe. Hitherto it had been but a leaderless, formless group of people, creeping to the same hiding place at nightfall to share in the food of the fortunate, and shudder at the fate of those who might not appear. Now Burl had walked boldly to them, bearing upon his back the gray bulk of a labyrinth spider he had slain with his own hands. 
and clad in wonderful garments of a gorgeousness they envied and admired. They hung upon his words as he struggled to tell them of his adventures, and slowly and dimly they began to look to him for leadership. He was wonderful. For days they had listened breathlessly to the tale of his adventures, but when he demanded that they follow him in another and more perilous affair, they were appalled. A peculiar strength of will had come to Burl. He had seen and done things that no man in the memory of his tribe had seen or done. He had stood by when the purple hills burned, and formed a funeral pyre for the hordes of army ants, and for uncounted thousands of flying creatures. He had caught a leaping tarantula upon the point of his spear, and had escaped from the web of a banded web spider by oiling his body so that the sticky threads of the snare refused to hold him fast. He had attacked and killed a great gray labyrinth spider. But most potent of all, he had returned and had been welcomed by Saya, Saya of the swift feet and slender limbs, whose smile roused strange emotions in Burl's breast. It was the adoring gaze of Saya that had roused Burl to this last pitch of rashness. Months before, the clotho spider in the hemispherical silk castle of the gruesome decorations had killed and eaten one of the men of the tribe. Burl and the spider's victim had been together when the spider appeared, and the first faint gray light of morning barely silhouetted the shaggy, horrible creature as it leaped from the ambush behind a toadstool toward the fear-stricken pair. Its attenuated legs were outstretched, its mandibles gaped wide, its jaws clashed horribly as it formed a black blotch in mid-air against the lightning sky. Burl had fled, screaming, when the other man was seized. Now, however, he was leading half a dozen trembling men toward the inverted dome in which the spider dozed. Two or three of them bore spears like Burl himself, but they bore them awkwardly and timorously. Burl himself was possessed of a strange, fictitious courage. It was the utter recklessness of youth coupled with the eternal masculine desire to display prowess before a desired female. The wavering advance came to a halt. Most of the naked men stopped from fear, but Burl stopped to invoke his newly discovered inner self that had furnished him with such marvelous plans. Quite accidentally he had found that if he persistently asked himself a question, some sort of answer came from within. Now he gazed up from a safe distance and asked himself how he and the others were to slay the clotho spider. The nest was some forty feet from the ground, on the underside of a shelf of rock. There was sheer open space beneath it, but it was firmly held to its support by long silken cables that curled to the upper side of the rock shelf, clinging to the stone. Burl gazed, and presently an idea came to him. He beckoned to the others to follow him, and they did so, their knees knocking together from their fright. At the slightest alarm they would flee, screaming in fear, but Burl did not plan that there should be any alarm. He led them to the rear of the singular rock formation, up the gently sloping side and toward the precipitous edge. He drew near the point where the rock fell away. A long tentacle-like silk cable curled up over the edge of a little promontory of stone that jutted out into nothingness. Burl began to feel oddly cold, and something of the panic of the other men communicated itself to him. This was one of the anchoring cables that held the spider's castle secure. He looked and found others, six or seven in all, which performed the task of keeping the shaggy, horrid ogre's home from falling to the ground below. His idea did not desert him, however, and he drew back to whisper orders to his followers. They obeyed him solely because they were afraid, 
and he spoke in an authoritative tone, but they did obey, and brought a dozen heavy boulders of perhaps forty pounds weight each. Burl grasped one of the silken cables at its end, and tore it loose from the rock for a space of perhaps two yards. His flesh crawled as he did so, but something within him drove him on. Then, while beads of perspiration stood out on his forehead, induced by nothing less than cold physical fear, he tied the boulder to the cable. The first one done he felt emboldened, and made a second fast, and a third. One of his men stood near the edge of the rock, listening in agonized apprehension. Burl had soon tied a heavy stone to each of the cables he saw, and as a matter of fact there was but one of them he failed to notice. That one had been covered by the flaking mold that took the place of grass upon the rocky eminence. There were left upon the promontory several of the boulders for which there was no use, but Burl did not attempt to double the weights on the cables. He took his followers aside and explained his plan in whispers. Quaking they agreed, and trembling they prepared to carry it out. One of them stationed himself beside each of the boulders, Burl at the largest. He gave a signal, and half a dozen ripping, tearing sounds broke the sullen silence of the day. The boulders clashed and clattered down the rocky side of the precipice, tearing, perhaps peeling, the cables from their adhesion to the stone. They shot into open space, and jerked violently at the half-globular nest which was wrenched from its place by the combined impetus of the six heavy weights. Burl had flung himself upon his face to watch what he was sure would be the death of the spider as it fell forty feet and more, imprisoned in its heavily weighted home. His eyes sparkled with triumph as he saw the ghastly, trophy-laden house swing out from the cliff. Then he gasped in terror. One of the cables had not been discovered. That single cable held the spider's castle from a fall, though the nest had been torn from its anchorage, and now dangled heavily on its side in mid-air. A convulsive struggle seemed to be going on within. Then one of the arch-like doors opened, and the spider emerged, evidently in terror and confused by the light of day, but still venomous and still deadly. It found but a single of its anchoring cables intact, that leading to the cliff-top hard by Burl's head. The spider sprang for the single cable, its legs grasped the slender thread eagerly, while it began to climb rapidly up toward the cliff-top. As with all the creatures of Burl's time, its first thought was of battle, not flight and it came up the thin cord with its poison fangs unsheathed, and its mandibles clashing in rage. The shaggy hair upon its body seemed to bristle with insane ferocity, and the horrible thin legs moved with desperate haste as it hastened to meet and wreak vengeance upon the cause of its sudden alarm. Burl's followers fled, uttering shrieks of fear and Burl started to his feet, in the grip of a terrible panic. Then his hands struck one of the heavy boulders. Exerting every ounce of his strength, he pushed it over the cliff just where the cable appeared above the edge. For the fraction of a second there was silence, and then the indescribable sound of an impact against a soft body. There was a gasping cry and a moment later the curiously muffled clatter of the boulder striking the earth below. Somehow the sound suggested that the boulder had struck first upon some soft object. A faint cry came from the bottom of the hill. The last of Burl's men was leaping to a hiding place among the mushrooms of the forest, and had seen the sheen of shiny armor just before him. He cried out and waited for death, but only a delicately formed wasp rose heavily into the air, 
bearing beneath it the more and more feebly struggling body of a giant cricket. Burl had stood paralyzed, deprived of the power of movement after casting the boulder over the cliff. That one action had taken the last ounce of his initiative, and if the spider had hauled itself over the rocky edge and darted toward him, slavering its thick spittle and uttering sounds of mad fury, Burl would not even have screamed as it seized him. He was like a dead thing. But the oddly muffled sound of the boulder striking the ground below brought back hope of life and power of movement. He peered over the cliff. The nest still dangled at the end of the single cable, still freighted with its gruesome trophies, but on the ground below a crushed and horribly writhing form was moving in convulsions of rage and agony. Long hairy legs worked desperately from a body that was no more than a mass of pulped flesh. A ferocious jaw tried to clamp upon something, and there was no other jaw to meet it. An evil-smelling, sticky liquid exuded from the mangled, writhing thing upon the earth, moving in terrible contortions of torment. Presently an ant drew near, and extended inquisitive antennae at the helpless monster wounded to death. A shrill stridulation sounded out, and three or four other foot-long ants hastened up to wait patiently, just outside the spider's reach, until its struggles should have lessened enough to make possible the salvage of flesh from the perhaps still living creature for the ant city a mile away. And Burl, up on the cliff-top, danced and gesticulated in triumph. He had killed the Clotho spider, which had slain one of the tribesmen four months before. Glory was his! All the tribesmen had seen the spider living. Now he would show them the spider dead. He stopped his dance of triumph and walked down the hill in haughty grandeur. He would reproach his timid followers for fleeing from the spider, leaving him to kill it alone. Quite naively Burl assumed that it was his place to give orders, and that of the others to obey. True, no one had attempted to give orders before, or to enforce their execution, but Burl had reached the eminently wholesome conclusion that he was a wonderful person, whose wishes should be respected. Burl, filled with fresh notions of his own importance, strutted on toward the hiding-place of the tribe, growing more and more angry with the other men for having deserted him. He would reproach them, would probably beat them. They would be afraid to protest, and in the future would undoubtedly be afraid to run away. Burl was quite convinced that running away was something he could not tolerate in his followers. Obscurely and conveniently in the extreme back of his mind, he reasoned that not only did a larger number of men present at a scene of peril increase the chances of coping with the danger, but they also increased the chances that the victim selected by the dangerous creature would be another than himself. Burl's reasoning was unsophisticated but sound, perhaps unconscious but none the less effective. He grew quite furious with the deserters. They had run away. They had fled from a mere spider. A shrill whine filled the air, and a ten-inch ant dashed at Burl with its mandibles extended threateningly. Burl's path had promised to interrupt the salvaging work of the insect, engaged in scraping shreds of flesh from the corslet of one of the smaller beetles slain the previous night. The ant dashed at Burl like an infuriated fox-terrier, and Burl scurried away in undignified retreat. The ant might not be dangerous, but bites from its formic acid-poisoned mandibles were no trifles. Burl came to the tangled thicket of mushrooms in which his tribe-folk hid. The entrance was tortuous and difficult to penetrate, and could be blocked on occasion with stones and toadstool pulp. Burl made his way toward the central clearing, and heard, as he went, the sound of weeping, and the excited chatter of the tribespeople. 
those who had fled from the rocky cliff had returned with the news that Burl was dead, and Saya lay weeping beneath an overshadowing toadstool. She was not yet the mate of Burl, but the time would come when all the tribe would recognize a status dimly different from the usual tribal relationship. Burl stepped into the clearing, and straightway cuffed the first man he came upon, then the next and the next. There was a cry of astonishment, and the next second instinctive fearful glances at that entrance to the hiding place. Had Burl fled from the spider, and was it following? Burl spoke loftily, saying that the spider was dead, that its legs, each one the length of a man, were still, and its fierce jaws and deadly poison fangs harmless for evermore. Ten minutes later, he was leading an incredulous, awed little group of pink-skinned people to the spot below the cliff where the spider actually lay dead, with the ants busily at work upon its remains. And when he went back to the hiding-place, he donned again his great cloak that was made from the wing of a magnificent moth, slain by the flames of the purple hills, and he sat down in splendor upon a crumbling toadstool to feast upon the glances of admiration and awe that were sent toward him. Only Saya held back shyly until he motioned for her to draw near, when she seated herself at his feet and gazed up at him with unutterable adoration in her eyes. But while Burl basked in the radiance of the tribe's admiration, danger was drawing near them all. For many months there had been strange red mushrooms growing slowly here and there all over the earth, they knew. The tribe's folk had speculated about them, but forebode tasting them because they were strange, and strange things were usually dangerous and often fatal. Now those red growths had ripened and grown ready to emit their spores. Their rounded tops had grown fat, and the tough skin grew taut as if a strange pressure were being applied from within. And today, while Burl luxuriated in his position of feared and admired great man of his tribe, at a spot a long distance away upon a hilltop, one of the red mushrooms burst. The spores inside the taut, tough skin shot all about as if scattered by an explosion, and made a little cloud of reddish, impalpable dust which hung in the air and moved slowly with a sluggish breeze. A bee, droned into the thin red cloud of dust, lazily and heavily flying back toward the hive, but barely had she entered the tinted atmosphere, when her movements became awkward and convulsive, effortful and excited. She trembled and twisted in mid-air in a peculiar fashion, then dropped to the earth while her abdomen moved violently. Bees, like almost all insects, breathe through spiracles on the undersides of their abdomens. This bee had breathed in some of the red mushroom's spores. She thrashed about desperately upon the toadstools on which she had fallen, struggling for breath, for life. After a long time she was still. The cloud of red mushroom spores had strangled or poisoned her, and everywhere the red fringe grew such explosions were taking place one by one, and wherever the red cloud hung in the air creatures were breathing them in and dying in convulsions of strangulation. End of chapter 1